couple minutes. I mean, it doesn't take a couple minutes, but it's still setting up. Okay. I'm ready. We're ready. All right. Hey guys, this is Tom. Welcome. It is the day before Earth Day. I'm pretty sure that's why I theme tonight is what on earth. Now that could mean many things to many different people. I'm glad I'm on earth. That's about as good as I'm gonna get. My idea of communing with nature is from inside a glass enclosed, air conditioned holiday inn. So I'd like to welcome you to the Indie Story Slam produced by Freetown Village and Storytelling Arts of Indiana. And we'd like to thank our sponsors right now, Jim Obermeyer and Sally Perkins, as well as the Nicholas Noyes Jr. Memorial Foundation. And never let us forget our media sponsor, WFYI. Well, welcome. I'm going to go over the rules just in case. You know, tonight's stories must be told in the first person, must be true. All my stories have a little yeast added to them, so we won't hold that against you. It must be told in the first person and based on the theme, what on earth? And remember, your story should not be any longer than five minutes. We've got prizes. Our first place winner will receive $50 plus a household ticket to the show, The Immigrant on April 24th by Antonio Hasha. Second place winner will receive 25 big ones. And our third place winner receives 10 buckaroos. We are blessed to have our judges tonight, Michelle Goodrich, Alice Mattingly, and Becky Ryder. I think this is the first time we have actually told who the judges are. They might have figured it out before, but I'm keeping it hush. Welcome. Celestine. Yes. So, so you know, Tom is here. He's on the phone. Oh, that's a fancy icon, Tom. Welcome. <laughs> well, thank you. I don't, I don't know what it looks like. It's a phone icon. That's all. It looks like a phone. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you're here. Thanks for calling in because you are our first teller, Tom Corbett. <laughs> what on earth? <laughs> tell us tonight. You're on. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me and taking me this way. I'm I'm uh, just pulled off the road. I'm traveling. So, um, okay. what on earth reminded me of, well, this being a cicada year, reminded me of the last time we had cicadas uh, here in Indiana. And um, it, it was during that time that my niece had purchased a, a, a very nice used car. It was only a couple of years old. And um, I bet she had it about two months. And she called me. She said, uh, Tom, the car is making a funny noise. And, you know, it's like, Okay, how many times have you heard somebody say that the car is making a funny noise or yourself? And so I was talking to her about it as well. You know, is it when you're driving forward, when you're driving reverse, turning a corner? When does it happen? Tell me more about it. And, um, and, and she thought about that for a minute. She said, well, let me call you back. Because she wanted to make sure she was giving me the right information. And probably about an hour later, she called back. She said, well, I don't hear it when I back out of the driveway, but I hear it when I start to drive away. So only going forward. She said, and, and turning corners, um, when she was reversing, turning, she didn't hear it. But again, going forward, turning, she heard it. So it seemed like it was any time she was going forward. <laughs> and I, I said, so what does it sound like? And she said, cicadas. Oh, no. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Now, I've never heard someone describe a car noise as cicadas. And, and I'm pretty sure none of you have either. Uh, so we had a good laugh. And I said, well, hey, 
I'm just going to have to come over and, and drive it, hear this. And so, um, so I did what she did. I did the backing up, pulling forward, turning and all that. But every time that car was in a forward motion, it sounded like cicadas. And, uh, I said, I said, I think it's the rear differential. And so it was still under their warranty. Like I said, she hadn't had it very long. So she, uh, she took it to them and sure enough, it, the rear differential was going out. It was one of the gears, but, uh, I'll tell you what, it sounded like cicadas. So, uh, so when you guys hear the cicadas start coming out here next month, a little, little later than that, that's what that car sounded like. <laughs> um, that's funny. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I'm hey, I'm going to, um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's just odd that that doesn't happen very often, these cicadas. But, uh, hey, I'm going to sign off. You guys, thanks for having me, and have a great evening. Thanks for helping us. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. Now, before this is over, I'm going to research the sound that a cicada makes, okay? So I'm going to play it for you if I find it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, our first, our next teller tonight Drum roll, please. Da, 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 is Leslie O. Leslie, are you ready? Hi, how are you? <laughs> you want me to start? Just cold turkey like this. Okay. I think if you had met her in person, you would have said, What on earth is this? She looked exactly like the bippity boppity boo fairy godmother in Cinderella but she wasn't a godmother. She wasn't a magician. She wasn't magic. She was a human engineer, a real one. And she didn't have a medical degree. She didn't have a PhD. She didn't have a master's and she never went to college. She came by her credentials by a school of hard knocks, and she was proud of it. Her claim to human engineering expertise meant that she thought she could fix people's lives by moving people around and making them do things that she thought they ought to do because it was better for them. Without consulting them, without sometimes even knowing them, and some people would have said she was a busy buddy or a nosy woman, uh, and she, they were probably right. And other people would have said she was manipulative, and that's the real word. I knew her as my grandmother Rose, and quite frankly, I didn't like her. She manipulated my life from the day I was born, and I have always resented it. But when I was in college, my mother persuaded me to stop and spend four days with her on my way home by train. I was extremely reluctant, but I did. I thought I'm getting old enough and I have developed some maturity and tolerance. Maybe I can endure four days with Grandma Rose. Her house in Kansas City was all overrun with handcrafts of the most unusual kind. I mean, not just the knitted uh, crocheted uh, doilies that you put all over everything, populate your house like polka dots, but she bought these dolls that were precursors of Barbies and they had great big boobs and platinum hair and red hair and black hair and none of them had gray hair or white hair like me, of course. And she dressed these dolls in plastic doilies of all things that she bought in gross in all kinds of colors, pink and green and blue and yellow, bright colors. 
And she'd take the doily and fold it in fours and cut a circle in the middle for the waist. And then out, then out of that circle, she would fashion a strapless top that she would glue to the skirt. And then she would glue ribbons and sequins and buttons and beads around the hem and around the waist and sometimes in the hair and sometimes right on top in the middle of her heart. Now she made all these wonderful things to make money for the Mother's Club, which she founded. She claims she founded it anyway. And the Mother's Club had a mission to raise money to help poor hillbillies in the Missouri Ozarks. And Grandma Rose had just been sitting on pins and needles waiting for me to arrive because she had this scheme that we would put all of these crafts that she had made for months and that the other Mother's Club members had made, we would stuff them into her car and head off to the Ozarks to sell them, which we did. Now this car was loaded beyond belief. If you took one look at this car, the way it was then, this old jalopy, you would have said, what on earth is that coming down the road? She stuffed the passenger seat in front from floor to ceiling with boxes and doilies and dolls and all this stuff. And she stuffed the back seat behind her, likewise, all the way to the roof of the car. And there was hardly room for me to fit in. I was a grown girl. I was a college student. I was, I was full size. And I could hardly fit. I had dolls hanging from my hair and around my neck. Everything. We couldn't put them in boxes. They were too fragile. Well, we headed off into the Ozarks, and she well knew her way. She made this trip many times. And eventually, we stopped for gas. And the gas station attendant came out to wait on us, and she said, uh, Are you married, sir? And he said, uh, not anymore, not, not that I know of. My, my wife left me, ran off, left me a couple of days ago. And uh, she said, uh, well, uh, ha have you adjusted yet? Are you, are you thinking about looking for a new woman yet? Oh, no, I'm not no women anymore. I had enough trouble with the first one. Uh, uh. She said, well. I know the perfect woman for you. And at that point, my heart was filled with terror. She was going to auction me off right there from the seat of the car. They continued their conversation and she gave all of the wonderful stories of what this woman could do and what she looked like. And that she could arrange a meeting very easily that this woman was quite nearby. And I was crunching lower and lower and lower in my seat and the dolls were falling more over my head. And pretty soon I thought I was invisible, but I could hear the conversation. And she said, uh, I can give you, I can give you her address if you want it. If you're undecided, I can give you her address and even her telephone number. I'm sure she wouldn't mind. And he said, nah. Well, my grandmother went into the office to pay for the gas. And when she came back, as far as she knew, I wasn't even there. And she was waving this paper in the air. And she said, I got his address and phone number. I didn't say anything. And we had it off again. After we had gone a little way, she says, uh, you can come out of hiding now, Leslie. <laughs> I came out of hiding. And she said, he was a really nice fellow. I was trying to hook him up with my sister. I said, oh, I didn't believe her for a minute. Well, let me tell you, that's the last time I visited Grandma Rose by myself. I felt she was a danger to me and to any other innocent person who was ripe for being manipulated. But I want to tell you a side story 
kind of an appended story. Happened not too many days after I left from this visit. My sister went to a small Presbyterian college just outside of Kansas City. And it was ideal because she could go into the city and visit my grandmother fairly often, which she did. And she was at college one day and a whole pile of her friends came rushing into her room and said, you won't believe what's out on the green. You've got to come right now and see it. It's incredible. What on earth is it? This old lady with white hair with a girl that had her so girded in, she walked like a robot, drove up in this jalopy, got out, opened her trunk and unloaded all these things she'd made. And she read her quilts over the grass and she put all of her wares out and she set herself up in the business she did. And boy, has she got a crowd. Come see, come see right now. And Sarah went racing with her. She knew exactly who was there and she was right. She ran into the corner and there is Grandma Rose sitting in the middle of the quilt, paying court to all these college students who are picking up all her wonderful little things and appreciating them so much. And she heard one of them say, but she's a real genuine hillbilly. I've never seen one of those before. And someone else said, I'm going to buy this. I'm going to keep this forever because then I will have something handmade by a genuine Hillbilly from the Missouri Ozarks. Isn't that wonderful? Well, I just ask you one big question. How many universes do you think you can fit between those two stories? a real live hillbilly that I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I got a request. Do you guys actually want to know the order of the tailors before it happens? I got one person who wants to know. Anyway, I've been trying to do two things at once. You might know that our next month title for our story slam is Respect Your Mother. And it's going to take place on May 19th. Don't forget about respecting your mother and Mother's Day, okay? Okay. Um, our next teller is Stephanie Holman. Stephanie, hey. Hey, hear me okay? I can hear you. Oh, it's so good to be with all of you. I'm Stephanie Holman and I'm, I'm born and raised in Bloomington, Indiana. And what on earth am I doing in the state of Maine? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you that for the last eight years, as my husband and I were describing to my family and friends and coworkers that we were moving to the state of Maine, the most often asked question was, why Maine? It's a little bit intangible, but the reason I give and is true is I just wanted new vistas. I was raised in Indiana. I love the flora and fauna of our beautiful state, um, all the way from the Indiana dunes down to uh, the toe of, of New Harmony and the toe of Indiana, as I like to call it, <laughs> the big toe of Indiana. So many wonderments. But uh, we were ready for new vistas. And here on Mid Coast, Maine, I got to tell you, I got what I asked for. I have beautiful things to see. Now there's still the morning cloak butterfly that just came out of hibernation up here in Maine, as well as in Indiana. And uh, a lot of similarities, uh, you know, we have our deciduous trees, but uh, the deciduous trees here are greatly taken over by uh, the land of the pointed fir. 
Uh, so I've been trying to learn the flora and the fauna of my uh, new home here in Maine while I visit Indiana and think of Indiana constantly in my mind. So I like to hike. There's so many great hikes here. And so uh, I'll just tell you about a few of them to help you see some of the similarities and differences. So for instance, once on a, a little hike across a bridge to an island on the Atlantic coast in what's Spruce Head, Maine, I was coming back. I'd been about a um, 45 minute hike and I was coming back toward civilization on this hike. And I was alone and my thoughts and physically. And I was just in that Zen state of walking when a crash in the brushes next to me brought my attention. And I thought, what on earth? Well, I, I knew what it was. This Hoosier knew what it was. I saw a glimpse of short black hair on a tight, Hind corner. Oh, well, it's a cow. It's got to be a cow. It's got to be a cow, right? Or draft horse. It's a draft. No. Takes a little while, but the Indiana brain did it. It was my first sighting of a moose. Luckily, the hind end of a moose, as it ran away from me, I had scared it as much as it scared me, which is what you want to have happen. You want the moose to go away from you. So that was something I wouldn't see in Indiana. And, and another time that I was hiking down just across the street, there is, a, so I'm out on this neck of land and there's this pier and the ocean and, and beach and, and all kinds of hikes. And so again, I, but this time I have my dogs and I'm walking them and we're headed down the sweet little idyllic path to the beach and what on earth right here the I've never seen anything like it it was bumbly and it was low to the ground and it was waddling and my dogs you know we're all what is that and it looked up at us and ding 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 who's your brain categorizing <laughs> porcupine my oh. first porcupine the dog starts to lunge the porcupine mm, looks at the, we all stayed away and that is one reason why one of many that my dogs will never be off leash in the state of Maine <laughs> you just never know what you're going to see that's why we go out so that's why we walk but you never know but you know you have to cat you have to figure it out and one day we were on one of our favorite trails just down the way Hackett Trail wooded beautiful but there's this swath of sky where there are no trees on uh, on the pathway and we see coming again uh, from the Atlantic Ocean which is on either side of this neck of woods a bird now I know my birds and I knew this bird right away from the Hoosier heartland I knew this bird it would come by every summer and leave every fall the osprey I identify but ew, oh my goodness it what on earth it's deformed it's strange looking it's Oh, it's got a fish in its talons. That's why it's looking so strange and it's flying right over us. And that's when the fish broke free and fell and landed splat right at our feet. I kid you not. And that's when I saw that it was no fish that we'd have in Indiana. Holy mackerel. It was a mackerel. We don't get those in Lake Monroe. So I knew <laughs> we were on something. But every time when you're out there on this earth, you can look up, you can look down, you can look straight ahead, but whatever you do, look out because you don't know what <laughs> might be on earth. The end. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> true, those are true. <laughs> Blessing. I love it. Of course, you know, can't commune with mother nature. I gotta stay inside. My neighbor just rang my doorbell. I'm sure it's because he's cutting trees down in the backyard. I don't know if the limb fell down or not because I can count the times I have actually been in my backyard. And that's besides the time I used to go out there and cut the grass. And I want him to know that whatever he wanted to ask me permission about, do whatever you want to do if it's out there in the yard. If you want to dig a pool, go right ahead. If you want to cut those trees growing between our property that should not be there, go ahead. 
my neighbor once, my older neighbor came over and asked me if we could go in together to cut a dead tree down between our properties. And I said, dead tree? What dead tree? And he took me out down my driveway to show me the dead tree that was straddling our property line. So like, I'm not a nature girl. Put me inside the library if you must, but do not put me outside because girlfriend does not know how to commune with nature. But I know a storyteller who does have a story about what on earth. It is our next teller, Portia Scholler Jackson. Portia, are you ready? Hello, hello. Let me tell you, I, I, I must have been, oh, um, 10 years old. And we had a ritual and uh, annual summer time experience with Roselle and Maggie Moore in Payne Town, Indiana on Monroe Reservoir. Each summer we would pack up and we would spend two weeks under the brush umbrella of trees, pine, maple, spruce trees, elm trees. And we had the best time in our lives. We connected with nature. My grandfather would do some of the most interesting things when he would chop and prepare wood for the fire to cook our meals. We would go fishing and oh my goodness, we love going fishing and riding in Uncle Tippy's boat. Uncle Tippy's boat was so fast. And of course we would wear the, um, the life jackets, those orange life jackets. And we would sit and we would fly in that boat and we were so happy. Why were we so happy? Because we were connecting with nature. During the day, my grandmother would often point out to us the different birds that would fly about and, and she taught us to, to sit and close our eyes and listen to the sparrows and listen to the robin red breast and listen to the cardinals sing their very wonderful songs. And then we knew at nighttime there was a reason why we would cover up certain things. And then we figured out why granddaddy never slept. And that was because he kept enough wood chopped to keep the fire going to make sure the night creatures would not come out and get us. I'm talking <laughs> raccoons and other little buzzard animals. And even deer were known to come right through our camp. Oh my goodness, we were so in tune with nature. Now, one of the reasons why we were so in tune with nature was because my grandfather had Native American um, heritage and he loved, you know, just being out and he would teach us about how the moss grew on one side of a tree and, 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 and why that was and, and how not to be lost. And I'm not going to tell you this. I don't think I'm not going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you. <laughs> we learned how to pop a squat. It was nature, natural, they would tell us, because we couldn't travel each time we had to go all the way over to where the, um, the restroom facilities were over at what we call the beach area. Now, I'm going to get to that beach area in a minute. But just this whole thing about having a little shovel and going out into the woods and groups to go handle our Papa Squat business, my grandfather would say was con uh, connecting to nature and, and that it would fertilize the ground and mushrooms and other things would grow and some you could eat and some you could. But all of this time we spent with my grandparents in Paintown was 
something I look forward to. So we fished, we rode in the boat, we play games, we make s'mores, we listen to the birds, we watch the raccoons, we even watch the beavers build a dam on the side of the reservoir where we fished and where we got on the boat. But on the other side of the reservoir, there was a beach. And me and my grandmother and my aunts and my cousins, we would all go there and spend a lot of time at the beach and we had a good time. And of course, yes, they had restroom facilities there. So there was no papa squatting. However, I thought that when we were enjoying ourselves at the beach, you know, at the beach. Now, by the age of 10, I had been to the Atlantic Ocean and I had been to the Pacific Ocean and we had did a lot at Kentucky Lake, but Monroe Reservoir had a beach and we swam in this water. And despite the fact that we were taught to stay connected to nature, one day I was out on the beach with my little cousin, Angela. My grandmother sat not far. And Angela and I were building sandcastles and everybody else was out in the water, just splatting around. And we dug down and guess, oh my God, it was a whole fish, a whole fish. What on earth? Grandmother, why is this fish up on the beach? It's in the sand. Oh my God. Oh my God. And my grandmother turned around and she looked at me and she said, what on earth are you all upset about? And I said, grandmother, it's a dead fish. It's in the sand. It's right here. Look, look, look. How did it get here? My grandmother gave me a look like, Portia, baby, you done lost your mind. She said, honey, it came up with the from the water, from the tide that comes up at night. And I'm like, the fish was in the water that we swim in? She said, well, yes, baby, that's the water. Yes. I'm like, well, we swim here. We fish over there. We ride the boat way over there. Why is the fish in the sand where we swim? And my grandmother looked at me and she said, why on earth is this upsetting you so? You didn't know you were swimming with the fish? And at that point, I realized all this nature stuff was not for me. I was no more popping, squatting. I didn't give a care in the world other than to eat fish. But I did not want to swim with fish. Why on earth did the good Lord design a beach for swimming to have fish swimming with me? And I tell you, that is truly my what on earth was the good Lord thinking. And that, <laughs> I tell you, is the end of that. <laughs> That's wonderful. And I know, traumatized. <laughs> Thank you so much, Portia. Um, well, I'm looking around to make sure nobody else has joined our room now. If you are late, come on, show your, show your face or your name, we'll put you right in place. But until then, we're going to listen to Brendan Burrow. Brendan, you've got the floor. Wonderful. Um, Leslie, can I have you mute, please? Leslie? Am I mute? You, oh. you, are, you are not muted. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, OK, so I'm 40 years old, just turned 40, and I don't think there's anything particularly fun about getting old, but it can be hilarious in res retrospect. And I'm sure there have been many times when most of us say, what in the world is going on? But I just wanted to point out three main moments that I decided were the exact moments. I got just a little bit older, starting with most recent and since going back to the second I realized I was no longer happy being a free-willed 20-something whose only worries included getting AA batteries at Best Buy for my portable DVD player um, while deciding whether or not skinny jeans were going to be a thing. 
and wondering whether or not I should sell my original Nintendo on eBay. That's right. If you're paying attention, that's my first example of being old. I'm old enough to thoughtfully remember eBay. So um, have any of you ever done this? Um, about a month ago, I noticed I was having trouble reading my phone. I couldn't scroll a thousand miles an hour and just read so fast that I needed a seatbelt. So I went into my display settings. And if you look at it, um, I had to change the font size, their little ticks. And it's on the second tick. So I'm like, that's too small. I go to the third tick. Nope, still, still can't see it. And then I go to the fifth tick, the last one, and I'm like, okay, this is way too big, right? So I'm having an internal dialogue about how no one will know except me, right? So I thought I'd trick myself into not being old. So I went down to the lowest setting, the smallest font. And that was clearly a mistake because I couldn't even see the letters. Um, I was looking at an alien language of hieroglyphics and slashes, like I couldn't see anything. So I set it to three, and even though I still can't see it, my ego isn't completely demolished. So there's that. Now, there are also a few things that will never make you feel older than if you are carefully watching your children. Nothing will show you how much time flies than looking at your own children. So. I met my wife, Sarah, and her triplets when the kids were three, two boys and a girl, Noah, Ayla, and Gabriel. We met downtown at the State Museum and where those bronze mammoths stand, uh, Sarah introduced me as Brendan. And Ayla said, no, you're Mato. And I said, what's a, what's a Mato? And their mother said, she's calling you Mater from the movie Cars. And I said, I'm a middle-aged redneck pickup truck. And the boys laughed and they agreed. And they said, yeah, you're Mato. And I was like, are you kidding me? I was in my prime, people, OK? I mean, I don't want to brag. I don't want to exaggerate. But I was the best looking human on the planet. So nothing uh, made me feel older than that at that time. But. The granddaddy of always, at least for many men, to feel old is when he starts going gray or bald, and even worse, starts making sounds. I was 21 when I got my first gray hair. I thought, no big deal. I'm a rational human being. I know I'm not old just because I have one gray hair. But when I was about 26 years old, fresh out of the Navy, I made what I call my first old man sound. And I won't be crass and just talk about bodily noises that are perfectly natural and we're all adults and we make them. No, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about are the sounds that come out of my mouth hole when I've apparently exerted my body too much in ways I was not prepared for. So there are three things. There's bra, there's ahem, and there's yeah. Bra is not me saying brother with a Hawaiian accent. Um, bra is not me declaring something about a feminine undergarment support system. It's the sound I make when I have eaten too much and I don't want to be impolite and belch like a frat kid, but I physically cannot stop myself from making any noise. So, bra, bra. That's what it is. <clears throat> Just like now, ahem is not the sound I make like most people do. You make it when you're soliciting disapproval or embarrassment. Ahem, I don't think so, young man. You put that toy dinosaur back where you found it. No, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, there's a tree, ahem. Um, Eating, not eating, drinking, not drinking, breathing, sleeping. <clears throat> <clears throat> Which begs the question, why? 
why am I making these sounds? That's, that's the second one that makes me feel old. So lastly, there is yeah. Now I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. Um, it's not an affirmation of something that someone asked me. Yeah. It's neither confirmation or declination of anything. It is the sound I make when I am lying down or sitting down. And I've done it so many times now that I've come up with the yeah conjecture. It is the direct relation of both extension and squared audible interference to the atrophy of its intermediary, which means the louder the yeah, and the longer you do it, the older you are. So everything that I do is yeah. That. Anyway, that's my story about getting old. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> oh, baby, you are so young. You just don't know what's in store for you. But my mother used to always say, you just keep living. Just keep living. Because you'll find out. You will find out. But I tell you, the alternative to aging is not good. Okay? At any rate, I want to remind you that tonight's show is uh, co-sponsored by Storytelling Arts of Indiana and Freetown Village. And we want to thank our sponsors again, Jim Obermeyer and Sally Perkins and the Nicholas Noyes Jr. Memorial Foundation. I'm telling you all that because we've got another storyteller waiting in the wings, ready to tell a story. And it is Carol Bus Bussell, right? Did I Bussell? Bussell. I don't know why I want to make your name like that. Carol you have the floor. Thank you. My story's title would be The Medicine Man and The Queen Bee and The Spider Web and The Stick Shift Car. Now, back in the 70s, I was in college and it was an Ivy League college called Cornell. You've heard about Cornell in one of my previous stories. Well, I've got another one. And it goes with, would you believe, which is close to what in the world. So the medicine show was something that we did as a ministry. We were all Methodists in this, in this one youth organization of probably a hundred different organizations. And there were two guys play guitar. Remember, this is the seventies. So you got the Peter, Paul, and Mary type people. Um, you got two girls singing. That was me and Jody. And there's this guy named Doug. Now, Doug was the transportation, and he was also the electric bass guitar that made this whole medicine show work because we gave scripture, we had a theme, and it all came together with music, of course. So Doug would drive us in his stick shift car, and he told us how you'd save gas in a stick shift car. And what it is, is when you're at the top of the hill, and in that part of the country, there's a lot of hills, you turn off the gas and you coast down the hill. And just as you're coming back up, you kick it back on and you keep going. And we did this on and on. And we were just kids. We thought, hey, this is a pretty cool idea. This was Doug's stick shift car. And I was so impressed. Well, the next thing I want to tell you about is Doug and the Queen Bee. So what was he caring about with him With him on our trips? We would do these little medicine show things in various little Methodist churches all around upstate New York, anything within an hour and a half from Cornell. And some of these churches were so small, they had a little pump organ that came out of my grandmother's attic. Um, they had pews and people singing in the ancient, ancient hymn books. And we just came in and gave them some fresh air, we thought. Um, with some song and some music and a great story. And, and since they already had an itinerant pastor going from little flag stop, little flag stop all, all over the countryside, we were just one more great show. Um, so what was in this little box? It's this big, it's a little box. It's kind of a cage wooden box. Inside was his queen bee. Who would have thought? Or would you believe? A queen bee went with us on our travels 
And this is because all of us were either in the human ecology, which was a new word for home ec, or the agriculture school. One was pre-med, one was going to be a pastor. Jody was a farm raised girl and I was too, but my dad also put things on the moon. And then there was Doug and he was living in a fire station more story about Doug, fire station, and he would collect the unlabeled cans from the grocery store, the ones that lost their label. He figured they're still safe if they're still sealed, so he'd eat those too. So Ivy League, yes, you might have seen Ivy League with all those rich preppy guys and their hot rods and all the rest, but then there were people like Doug. He was going to get to school one way or another. Okay, so in this little box was his queen bee. He was an entomology major. And as he traveled, he wanted to make sure that she was sustained. So on a toothpick, he would put a drop, just a fraction of honey, and he'd feed his bee. And then he would put a fraction of water on his toothpick and feed his queen bee. And it's like, who would have thought we brought a queen bee on our medicine show? Those are supposed to be very amazing places or amazing shows. Well, that was it. The next and most interesting one was our entomologist said, did you see what happened on Halloween? And we're all like, yeah, well, you already heard, you know, we, we did see the pumpkin on the top of Jenny McGraw Tower. Well, there was another thing that was on the tower across the way. So here's the tower and here's the seven story library and between it was a spider web hung between and it was like life size if you want to catch a real human being. Yes, indeed, a spider web. And he was able to tell us exactly what kind of spider could have woven that web. Guess who made the web? Our man, Doug. So he was his own kind of a medicine show storyteller as we were traveling along, going from little church to little church in his stick shift car. And I'll always remember that when you say, would you believe or what in the world, there were Ivy League guys out there who weren't the preppies, but who were very interesting people. What in the world? Well, that was wonderful. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> I just can't, I mean, well, the bee was in what kind of box again? It's in a little cage. Little it's cage. a little wooden box. Okay. It's about four inches by four inches by four inches with some, 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 you know, metal screen. And she's just hanging out waiting for her hive assignment. Right. And queen bees, a queen bee has one chance at being able to lay eggs. In other words, all the drones come around she has enough stuff to last her three years for egg laying. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he had her all prepped and ready and was put, going to put her in a hive. Well, you're going to have to finish that story. We're going to find out what happened to the hive, how many kids she actually had, where the hive ended up being. I, I, I'm just some more questions. Just some more questions, Carol. Thank you so much. <laughs> 2,300 per hive per year. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, there's some people who have not popped into the room yet, so I assume that our Zoom will continue with our next teller, Noel Bewley. Noel, nice to see you. Welcome. Great to be here. Uh, my story is about an uncle I absolutely loved if, um, I loved all my uncles and I had a lot of them, but this, this one was special for many reasons. And uh, the first one was, he was wounded in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. He was in a half track or a tank killer that was destroyed by a tank. And he was a lone survivor and he crawled out and spent a day and a night crawling uh, from his tank killer to the, uh, out of the German lines and back to the American lines. He kept shrapnel in his butt for many years until it worked its way down and cut a nerve in his calf. And so he had drop foot from the time he was in his 50s on. Uh, he worked, well, he was missing in action at that time and I still have the letter that they sent 
my aunt to, to say he was missing in action. Uh, he moved from Southern Kentucky on the farm to Illinois and worked for the pipeline. And then he decided after retiring to move back to Kentucky and he bought a big farm 10 miles from where he grew up. And when he grew up, he was an ornery guy that people walked across the street to stay away from. But he had no kids and he absolutely loved all of us. All of his nieces and nephews could do anything we want and they would let us do anything we want on their farm. And he had creeks running through it and we camped and hiked and fished and did all kinds of stuff. And Aunt Hazel made the greatest blueberry pie in the world. Well, one time I was 18 to 20 and I can't remember exactly. I wanted to fish on a big river. And I had heard him say he had a John boat that he and a friend bought and they kept on the river. And I just asked him, I said, would you take me down the river on a float trip? And he said, sure. And we got in his truck and I threw my gear in the back and he took off in his truck and the way he drove would drive anybody crazy because these country back roads with switchbacks and everything, he didn't care anything about his side of the road. He drove down the middle of the road at 60 miles an hour because he knew the road and scared me to death. No, he obviously had no seat belts on this truck. And I just held on like I was going to fly out the window at any moment. Well, we got on the river and he was 80 years old. And the only thing he had to steer us on the river was one canoe paddle. And if you don't know what a John boat is, it's pretty long boat with two square ends and it's very shallow. So it rides nice on a nice slow river. So I got my fishing gear out and stood in front of the boat and pointed to where I wanted to go on that river. And he just used that canoe paddle and took me crisscrossing that river, fishing anywhere I wanted to. And it was just gorgeous. And he could name the trees and the birds as we went along. And I was just having the time of my life, not catching a single fish, but I mean, I was with Uncle Jim and I was in a boat on the river. And I looked up while I was fishing and I could see in the distance that there was a sandbar in the middle of this river. And I didn't know which way to go. And he thought maybe we should go to the left side because it looked like the water was deeper there. And so I was perfectly fine with me, but then this slow river all of a sudden starts picking up speed and it's picking up speed where I'm uncomfortable with the speed that it's going. And we have no way to turn to the right side. We just have to follow this and it's getting more narrow and more narrow as we get into this and we're going faster. I throw all my gear in the bottom of the boat, I sit down in the boat and look, and in front of us in the narrowest place, a willow tree has all of its branches sticking in the water, just draped down all the way into the water. So I'm brilliant. I dip my hands under those branches, lifted them up, and dropped them behind me as we flew through there. And then I heard, oh, and then whomp and then splash. And I thought, oh my God, I've just killed my uncle. And I jumped out of the boat, grabbed the edge of the boat. Turns out it was only waist deep. I still thought I had drowned my 80 year old uncle because I couldn't see him. And up he stood way behind me upstream and his glasses were like this. His paddle was still in his hands and his hat was over to the side. And he looked at me and said, what on earth did you think I was gonna do? And he didn't say what on earth, but I can't say what he did say to me. And he went on for a while, as long as it took me to drag the boat back to him. 
And he climbed in the boat with bib overalls, totally soaked, flannel shirt, totally soaked, but he still had his wire rim glasses and he still had that wet hat dripping down. And we went on through and we made it through and I didn't fish very much the rest of the way. I was spending more time turned around facing him saying, are you all right? Uncle Jim, are you all right? Do you think? And we got to the end point where he could tie the boat off and someone picked us up in the truck and they asked what happened, of course, he's just dripping and he just shook his head. And I told the story sheepishly to the guy that picked us up and we drove home. And at that time he was 88, when he was 94, he still had that same truck. We auctioned his house and all of his property. And he, I followed him in my car through those country roads to his new apartment and I could not keep up with him. At 94, he was still driving faster on those roads than I had any business attempting to drive. And he never said what on earth or so-and-so, what did you think you were doing to me again? Because I never asked to go fishing with him again. And that's my story about the <laughs> What on earth, since that came to my mind as soon as I read it, and I didn't read what on earth. I read what the... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Noel, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, any other tellers out there? Let me scan the horizon. I don't see any new names. Your stories have just been delightful. Uh, what on earth? Remember tomorrow's Earth Day. Don't go fishing, no. Um, <laughs> plant a tree, everybody. Plant a tree. I want to thank uh, Storytelling Arts and Freetown Village yet again, as well as Jim Obermeyer and Sally Perkins and the Nicholas Knowles Junior Memorial Foundation. Remember, April 24th is Saturday. Uh, Antonia Hasha is telling the immigrant. Tickets are available at storytelling.org. Check us out, we'll be there. Be some good telling. I want to remind you that next month our sessions are on April 19th and the topic is respect your mother. Um, I, I think you need you me May. I'm sorry, <laughs> May 19th. Don't go there. Don't go there. It's over. May 19th. That's right. Um, I don't know what I'm supposed to be looking at right now. At any rate, uh, the stories were hilarious. I enjoyed each and every one. I wish I had a what on earth story to regale you with, but I don't do earth. I try to garden. When I garden, uh, things happen. Like I go out there, I plant. One year I had tomatoes that were as tall as my roof. And I went out there one day and there was a caterpillar on my tomatoes. So I let the caterpillar have the rest of them. And people would come and cut my grass and they said, oh, you have some gorgeous tomato. I said, take all you want. <laughs> because I never went back out in that yard again. So um, I'm gonna come up with a respect your mother story, but I can't do a nature one to save my life. Just like uh, uh, Stephanie down there in uh, Bloomington, we would go to Bradford Woods. I had decided to, I signed up to do a workshop that was a week long with students from all over the country. And we stayed in the cabins and some of the kids had to stay on these little flat pallet areas with tents, the boys. And each night more kids came in from all over the world. One girl had flown back from Puerto Rico cut their vacation short to come to this leadership camp. And I was doing some video workshops with the kids. The, if anybody's been in Bloomington in the middle of August, we used to call it the armpit of the world because the humidity was awful. 
and I'm not a camper. But I was gonna do this for the kids. So some girls that would come in and like mice were crawling across their feet. The girls were crying. I really didn't wanna give my bed up, but I was willing to give my bed to a kid and I was just gonna go out and sleep in my car. So I finally decided, look, I will drive to Bloomington every day to do this workshop if you just let me go home. And someone said, well, you've got to be all a part of it or not a part of it. You must be here at all times. And I'm looking at him, sweat is pouring off me. The camp nurse took my blood pressure. My blood pressure was sky high. I said, if I stay here any longer, I'm just gonna die. So I packed up all my car load of equipment. I had taken like three car loads of equipment down there. I packed it all up in my car. There was just room enough for me barely to squeeze in. Got in my car and drove all the way back to Indianapolis. And I called my boss and I said, I don't care if you fire me, but I'm not going back to Bradford Woods tonight. And that was the last time I went camping. So that's my little fiasco with mother nature. Well, I'd like to announce the winners. You have had some great stories. We have uh, a third place tie. We have Stephanie Holman and Noel Bewley. You have tied for third place. Thank you for sharing. It was wonderful. Our second place storyteller is Brendan Burrow. Congratulations, Brendan. And our first place storyteller is Portia Scholler Jackson. Congratulations. And I have enjoyed all these stories. Next month, May 19th, put it on your calendar now. Res respect your mother. All right. Have a great rest of the week. Hope to see you April 24th down. First place, well, second it's virtual, place. isn't it? Yeah. April 24th is virtual. Ellen, yeah, but get your tickets with Storytelling Arts. Do you have something to tell us, Portia? I was saying we had a good time. I'm glad. Thank you. I had a good time. It's good. I enjoyed. I really had a good time this evening. All right. Thank you so. Good much. job, Portia. All Thank right. you to everybody. Take care. Now I'm going to go open the wine.